Hi folks, see you speaking again. This is going to be the second project we built for a very simple purpose, to handle properly the breadboard. So let's start it. As we discussed a couple of videos ago, I said that this one is a uh, full section 840 holes breadboard. Uh, and I recommend to use one having the double for at least two reasons. One reason is because, at least for the beginners, the positive and negative are marked already, so it's going to be less confusing when using it. And second reason, of course, you can, uh, you can do uh, a bigger project on it than you can do on this one. But today I'm going to give you a third reason. Some components like this one here, if you want to plug them, you try to push them here, they won't enter, okay? So you're going to damage the board, keeping trying. It's going to enter this way, which is not good because on the five contacts which are ready together inside, you're going to completely short this transistor. So not good. I'm going to leave this one away. But this is the thickest component entering here, though, on this kind of breadboard. And the way the contacts are made, this one is a bit more user-friendly. And if I'm taking a second to just measure the thickness, the thickness of this one in metric is going to be around 0.8 millimeter, or in inches, 0 0.004 inches. Okay, so the the wire should be in the American system no thicker than uh, 22 gauge, and in the metric, again, no thicker than 0.8 millimeter thickness for any component. Of course, there is a solution to that if you don't have. If you don't have such a breadboard, but you only have this one, the solution is going to be instead of using the original transistor like this to, sh to solder three thinner wires on it. So this way is going to clearly enter inside even for the white breadboard. So this is the only way you can fix the problem. For any bigger components, you can solve the wires. It's not going to be that nice. It's going to be a bit uglier, but you solve the problem. Okay, let's go further. So I leave this one away, and we're going to use this one. Now the project for today is called the Hooper Alarm. It's, it has nothing to do with the logic we started to talk about. It's purely a, uh, a classical analog project, but I found it with my students, it's very challenging, at least for the beginners, when you do the wiring around the components. And this is the reason why I chose it for today. So I'm going to give you the tips to do it successfully, of course. What is this project about? If you just look on your uh, uh, search engine, Hooper Alarm made by Elenco Electronics, you're going to find some description. If you're not satisfied about what you find, you can uh, uh, make me a sign. And I'm going to put another, let's say, uh, less confusing description in a reply. Okay? But the point is not to discuss the internal diagram and how does it work. I want to prove to you, to show you that if you just follow a couple of simple wiring rules, you can make it working without having any knowledge about what does it do. What does it do, by the way? Take a look. I don't think that you can stand around it with the power on for too long with only a speaker of 3 watt. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, uh, check several kind of speakers just to show you what you can get out of it. I want to show you something else, though, just to make sure you understand my point. Here, this, if you take a look, it's 6.99, let's round it to 7 Canadian dollars. And this is a Hooper alarm already made. And it's not the one you have it installed on your car, it's much smaller. Take a look. It's very strong, okay? Why are we then wasting the time to build one if you can buy one with seven bucks, okay? The real reason behind this is what again? Is because not by buying one already made, by doing it yourself, that's the only way you are going to improve your skills using what? A breadboard. This is what we do it, okay? Again, if we just connect it. So this is the job for today. Now, let's take a look at the practical aspects of this because this is what I'm interested about today, okay? At first, you have to identify your parts. 
And what do you have here on that diagram? Uh, yes, you need a power supply, and the power supply here is going to be 9 volt. You don't need any kind of special switch because this is the power supply switch. Or when you plug the outlet, you make yourself the contact. You don't need an external switch for that. If you power it from a battery, for instance, you don't need that capacitor here because this is intended for additional filtering only for poor power supplies. As most of the power supplies today are very good, you may even miss this one, it won't change anything. I have it just to respect the diagram, I have it over here, mounted already, okay, between the positive and the negative. Now, let's start with the rest. You have here only four kinds of components. First kind of component, transistors. You have one, two, three, four, five transistors, that's it. Second, you have resistors. So you have from the resistor R1, R2, R3, up to R9, you have nine resistors. We are going to identify them. Third thing you have, you have capacitor, just a few capacitors. Forget about this one again, you have C1, C2, C3, three capacitors. And the fourth thing you have is a speaker. And we're going to, take, to talk about this as well, okay? So you have four kinds of components you have to identify. So, of course, you are going to add a fifth one if you need. It's not a component in itself, but it's the wiring you need around. Just to not have it too compact because I can make it with much less wiring than I have here, I provide for this pr little project 10 wires, only 10. Three are going to be in the form of naked wire already connected somewhere here, okay? And other seven wires, different colors over here, short, not too long, okay? After you identify the components, you're going to put them aside, okay? So I'm going to put aside the wiring. Okay, to clear the field. I'm going to identify the resistors. From the smallest one, you have 100 ohms. Then you have to find out two resistors, one kilo ohm each. Here they are. It's not a point today to talk about the color codes or to identify the resistors. If you have any doubt about them, just use a very cheap multimeter and that's how you're gonna find out, okay? Then you're going to have one resistor, which is this one, 2.2 kilo ohms. And then you're going to have another one here, 6.8 kilo ohms. Then you're going to have two resistors, 15 kilo ohms one resistor 22 kilo ohms, and finally, one resistor of 27 kilo ohms. So you put the resistors aside. Then you put the three capacitors aside. This big one here, an electrolytic capacitor, remember, the arrow or the dashes, they point to the negative terminal. If it is an axial capacitor like this, the metallical part of it is the negative. The electrolytic capacitors, they have a polarity, please, you have to respect it, otherwise the diagram won't work, okay? So that's the 100 microfarads, which is over here. Now, 47 nanofarads, or like they wrote on the diagram, 0 0.047 micro, is 47 nanofarads. We can put it here just to clarify. 47 nanofarads, okay? Here is the yellow guy. This is exactly 47 nanofarads, this one. And for the second one here, which, is, which should be identical, I don't provide another 47 nanofarads. I'm going to provide two identical capacitors of 22 nanofarad each, and we're going to mount them in parallel. Unlike the uh, resistors, the capacitors, when mounted in parallel, they add up, okay? So this is because I want to show you how to connect them properly on a breadboard without needing external wiring. So you have the capacitors here, job done. Then you have to identify the five transistors. I put them here now before discussing. So you put the parts aside, okay? So that was the next step to do. And now, what kind of steps you are going to follow to place these components properly here? You have to place first the semiconductors. But as you can see, the semiconductors are these transistors, the transistors having all three terminals. And if you're going to notice, there is only one 
this one here, where the arrow goes into the transistor, this is called a PNP. So I'm going to mark it like that, in red, because that's the only PNP transistor. The other ones are all NPN, okay? Just to signal the fact that the last one here, the last one here, it should be a bit more powerful than the rest. I chose it on purpose. This one, I'm gonna talk about it, okay? And in diagrams, you may find sometimes a second circle around with dashes instead of being an outline. And this is because the transistor can be placed on a heatsink if required. So if I want to place it on a heatsink, I can do this. Luckily, it's not required for our project, okay? So then, because there is only one PNP transistor and all the rest are NPN, I want to identify this transistor. To do what? As usual, to prevent the confusion. And take a look what is the tip I give you. We're going to pick up a shrinking tube, okay? And I'm gonna pick up the one fitting the transistor. I'm gonna pick up my transistor here, I know. It is uh, uh, PNP, this one, and I'm going to mark it by placing over it just a bit of shrinking cube. So, how can you shrink it? By using your uh, hot uh, iron, you just touch it, be careful to your fingers, because you only have to shrink the tube, not the fingers, okay? So when you do this, then you can easily cut the rest because the purpose was only to mark the transistor. So I'm doing it now in such a way that the shrinking tube won't fall down from my transistor. Good. And that's how I mark my transistor. So I know now this is going to be my PNP. Next tip I have to give you. I don't know what kind of transistors you are going to use, but I'm going to give you two versions. American versions. American transistors. Or European. Transistors. So, for the American ones, these very tiny, these very tiny transistors, you can see over here. Of course, they have a writing over it. You can't see it now, but I'm going to give it to you. In the American notation, let's say I'm going to mark it for the PNP. 2N2906 or 2907, to have examples. NPN, 2N... 2904, okay, uh, another model you can use is uh, 2219, okay, European transistors, PNP, you can easily use BC327, and for the NPN, you can easily use the BC337. Why am I putting these numbers? Simply because we have to understand how to plug the transistors on the breadboards. Unlike the integrated circuits, all integrated circuits, I picked up a big one here to be seen, all integrated circuits, analog or digital, remember there is a notch. Here is the notch to identify the position of the pin number one, which is over here. So. Take a look what I'm doing. I'm taking a look from the top. So when I see the printing, so for the integrated circuits, not only this one being so big, it has the notch, it has a countersink hole exactly over the pin one, and additionally, it has a white band pointing you to the pin one. So it's very difficult to miss the pin one for this. But for the transistors, example like this one here, all transistors are described in the specifications with the pins coming to my eyes. So it's not viewed like that or the small transistor is not viewed like that from the top. The pins are coming to my eyes. And this one here, if you can see, is not a complete circle. 
it has a flat side, and this is what we're going to use to identify the pins of the transistor, okay? So the pins of the transistors, we're not going to uh, uh, give them numbers one, two, three. We're going to just name them uh, collector, base, and e emitter. So luckily for these kind of small transistors, the base is in the middle, but it's not enough to identify them. I start with the American ones. If you take a look top to bottom, if I keep the uh, flat part on my left, it's going to be collector, base, emitter. So I'm writing it here by doing this. One pin, two pins, three pins, like this, coming to my eyes, collector, base, emitter. Now, why am I doing that? Simply because if you use the European ones, the European ones are arranged reverse way. What does it mean? You have to put it like this, like that, with the pins arranged like that, coming to your eyes, and then you're gonna have collector, base, and the emitter. So take a look at the difference. This is going to be my American one, top to bottom, collector, base, emitter, but if you use the European one, it's gonna be like that with a flat to my right, collector, base, emitter. So, my good advice, don't mess them up. Either use a set of American transistors or a set of European transistors. And to make sure you, you get a better chance if you do a mistake to not burn out the last transistor, the one where you connect the speaker, uh, I used here a bigger transistor. So here, I'm gonna use here for the American one, TIP31C. TI stands for Texas Instruments and P, Power Transistor. For this one here, if you take a look in the same way, like pins coming to my eyes, or to me anyway, front view, so you see the writing here, and this way, I'm gonna put it like that, TIP31, and the hole is here, and the three pins are like that. You're going to have base here, collector in the middle, and emitter over here, okay? Now, if you use a European one, a European one is this, okay? This is going to be equivalent for the NPN, BD135 or 137 or 139, either of them you have, okay? The problem with this is that the arrangement of the pins, like for the small ones, is reversed. So here you're going to have the metallical deposit on this one. Take a look, the metallical deposit on this one. Okay, so here I write it here, metal. Metal, okay. And then you're going to have base collector emitter. Because if you hold it like the other one front view, it's gonna be emitter collector base, okay? So for the big transistors, the collector is in the middle because it's touching the metallical side, okay? So good thing to know, okay? So th this one is American, this one is uh, European. I don't want to enter into details about that. However, there are little things you have to know. All of them are silicon transistors. How do I know? In the American system, you just watch here how many digits are after the N, because the two before the N is the number of junctions. Yes, it's a transistor. And N is used like a, a, a separating point, like when you write uh, google.com, is like the dot. And then the number of digits here, it tells you. If it is three digits, it's germanium. If it is four digits, it's silicon, okay? So this is a silicon transistor. European transistors, they don't have the same system, so don't judge this by the number of digits here. Three digits is not, is not germanium. In European system, it's the first letter who tells you. A is for germanium and B is for silicon, okay? So be careful, both kind of transistors are silicon, but just the, uh, uh, the standard used to name the transistor is completely different. However, they share something in common, these ones, American and European ones, all the small shaped transistors, is the casing, the housing. They call this the package, okay? The package, as anything else in industry, is following a standard. So this standard is TO92. TO stands for transistor outline, basically the housing. 
and 92 is the code sending you in the catalog when you're going to see this particular shape, the mechanical size, okay? And that's how it's telling you TO92. To make the distinction, this is a tiny diode. And this tiny diode, even it is so tiny uh, uh, glass made, the, the casing is made of glass, it's still following a standard. This is DO35. DO stands for diode outline because it's not a transistor, it's a diode, okay? And the core 35 sends you to the material is made, the shape it has, and the dimensions, okay? All these found were in the catalog, okay? Now, the uh, TIP31C is the typical casing or package TO220. The BD135, uh, 37, 39 are all transistor outline 126, okay? Just to make the distinction again, because these numbers, they send you in the catalog where you can find all the physical dimensions, orientation, and so on. To make a distinction versus this one, because this one won't enter on any breadboard, it's too big, this kind of transistor. This, for instance, is a, a, a casing uh, TO247. So it's very different from these ones. If you just take a look how big it is, okay? This one can still fit on a small heatsink, okay? There is no way you're gonna get that small heatsink fitting the bigger one. So you obviously will need another kind of heatsink like this one for the big transistors like this, okay? So this is one of the reasons you have to identify using the codes, what kind of outline you have for the transistors because you want them to fit. Coming back, be careful about the orientation. This is for American transistors. And the last one, let's say here, Q5, the transistor Q5, which is right here. Uh, and this one here also Q5 for European, okay? You can use American or European one. Now, let's go further. We identified the transistors and we've made our We've made our little PNP transistor distinctive, okay? Now for me, because I want to make a distinction between them, take a look, both these transistors are covered with shrinking tube. I used the red for American transistor, and if I use a European set, I put a green one over it, so that's how I know which is which. So I'm gonna use an American set of transistors, okay? So at this point here, I want to place the components over the breadboard, okay? So next tip I'm gonna give you is that for the collector of the transistors, uh, for the collector of the transistor, you are gonna place the collector in front of a number, whatever number you have here, okay? Because it's gonna be easier for you to watch the wiring, okay? So for instance, for this one here, if I place it like this, okay, the collector is exactly in front of the number, okay? Good. So now I'm going to pick up the uh, uh, NPN transistor, okay? And for the NPN transistor, I'm going to place it over here. But now I have to tell you what I just did, okay? I'm gonna use, let's say, another one, this one. I'm gonna tell you what I just did. And for this, I'm gonna pick up a fresh diagram where I removed a lot of notations. Just a second. Okay, so here, I want to connect these two transistors together and I'm gonna put it here. These are the holes on my breadboard. Remember, they are arranged in groups of five. So all these are related together inside, okay? So now, I'm picking up the first transistor and it's going to be something like this. One terminal here, 
one here and one here, okay? So this is going to be collector, base, emitter for my PNP transistor. And then I'm gonna connect the NPN transistor, which is going to be something like that, this way, okay? So when I'm gonna have my three pins here, is gonna be collector, base, emitter. Because you see on the diagram, the collector of the PNP goes to the base of the NPN. The collector of the PNP goes to the base. So I can do this without using any extra wiring. And what's remaining, you have the collector of the NPN going to the base of the PNP, collector of the NPN going to base of the PNP, same thing, I don't need any wire. So what's remaining for the outside connections, the emitter of the, of the PNP, which is here, and the emitter of the NPN, which is over here. So this is a nice way to connect these two together exactly as I did, okay? So then, if you did this, you can use, you can use a marker, that's another tip, to mark the connections you've made. You've made this one, you've made this one, you connected this one and that one. So these ones are done, okay? Now, what's the next thing you do? You place the other transistor. The next uh, uh, two transistors are very easy to place simply because they are little NPN ones. You just have to put them in adjacent holes. You don't need, you don't need to fold their terminals, you use them exactly as they come, okay, simply because this way is very easy. And you take a look here, the collector of the transistor is in front of a number. So I respect the same rule as before. I'm picking up the next one. So the next one I'm going to pick up, I'm going to place it over here. So by doing this, it's going to be the same principle, okay? And then I can use this one over here. Okay. I can use this one over here. So the transistors, one, two, three, four, five. I have my transistors. So far, so good. Now, I, I'm going to continue with the resistors. Take a look. The most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, bothering point is this one. Because exactly here, you have in the top a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor, you have here a 6.8 kilo ohm resistor, you have here another resistor 27 kilo ohms, and you have here another component which is 100 microfarads. So you need one, two, three, four connections. And these four connections are all on the emitter right here on the right side of it uh, on the PNP transistor. So I pick up the 27 kilo ohms, I don't have 27 kilo ohms, I have 30 kilo ohms, and it doesn't even have long legs. That's it. I'm going to use it, it's in the tolerance of 10%. So I'm going to pick up the uh, 27 kilo ohms and connecting it here exactly between the emitter, the emitter of the PNP transistor to where it's reaching, okay? And uh, uh, from there, I'm going to simply have a wire, okay? So exactly from here, because it has to reach this one, it has to reach to the base of the transistor Q4, okay? So it's gonna be somewhere here. So I finished with the 27, kilo ohm resistor and is reaching here okay next I'm picking up the 2.2 kilo ohms and I'm gonna make this link in the same emitter so I just have to pick up the right resistor so then from the same emitter over here is going to the positive line it's done next component I'm gonna pick up is the 6.8 kilo ohms the 6.8 kilo ohms is going to reach between 
the uh, emitter of the PNP transistor exactly to the base of the transistor Q3. It's exactly to the base transistor Q3. So I mark it down here and the component is connected. And the next thing I'm doing, the capacitor. We remember the capacitors, they have a polarity. So the arrow goes to the negative terminal and the negative terminal of the capacitor is to the ground and to the emitter. So all the five vertical holes are busy now and I didn't need additional wiring. So this was my capacitor, which is mounted. Now, the emitter of the NPN Q1 and the emitter Q3, these are together to a resistor of 100 ohms. So I'm going to pick up the 100 ohm resistor over here. I'm going to connect it to the negative. You have to always check your connection is done, okay? Because sometimes the components have very soft legs. And another trick about connecting any components with longer legs is that it doesn't matter if the legs are folded, but the last quarter inch or seven millimeter, it has to be straight. Because if it is not straight, it won't gonna make a good electric contact, okay? Very good. This time it entered properly. So I'm picking now two wires. I put them the same color because from the top leg of the resistor over here, from the top leg of the resistor, I'm gonna have a wire here to the emitter and another one to the other emitter. So that's what I'm doing quickly. I'm gonna put two wires and each of them goes to one emitter. One emitter is over here. Okay, went out, doesn't matter. And the other one is over here. Okay, so this one is done, this one is done, and the resistor is mounted. Top of the uh, transistor Q3 is a one kilo ohm resistor. I have one kilo ohm resistor over here. So from the uh, uh, collector of Q3, okay, it's opposite to the emitter. It went to the positive line. So this one is done, resistor mounted, this one done. And now talking about that network, one kilo ohm and the capacitor, remember here it was a 47 nano farads. Uh, this is a yellow guy. I have it over here. And on the other side, I'm gonna have two capacitors, 22 nanofarad each, 22 nanofarad each. And because of this, capacitors in parallel are, the, are exactly like resistors in series, they add up. So I'm gonna get a 44 nanofarads. It's not that far from 47. I want to show you at the same time, not only that you can mount two capacitors in parallel without needing additional wiring, and that's exactly what I'm doing now, but that the capacitors in parallel are adding up. And the third thing is that even if you are in a tolerance of about 10%, you're still good, the diagram is gonna work fine. And that capacitor is related here to the base of Q3 through the resistor one kilo ohm. So it was one kilo ohm remaining over here. So from the base of the Q3, it was right here to the capacitors. So this one is done. This link is done, resistor is mounted. The two capacitors are mounted. I just need a wire now to the collector of to the collector of is good Q4. So done. Okay. Next, the yellow guy. The yellow guy I'm going to mount over here. So I'm going to have two extra wires. 
to the two legs, one here, one here. So as you can see, one goes to the collector of the Q3, to the collector of the Q3 over here, okay? And the other one goes exactly to the base of the Q4. The trick here was, let me just mark it first, it done. The trick was, the capacitor here, 47 nanofarads, the yellow, I put it to the left, and the two 22 nanofarads, I put them on the right, so you can identify easily which is which. First, because they are not the same, different colors, and the position, I kept exactly the position like on the diagram because otherwise you're going to see that when you do the wiring yourself, it's going to be pretty confusing. So now, a couple of wires remaining. I have to link these two collectors together. So the two collectors together are linked by using this white wire. So this one and this one, remember, for the big transistor, the collector is in the middle, and for the transistor I mounted over here, the collector is on my left, okay? So now, what's remaining? I still need a 15 kilo ohm resistor. As you can see, there is only one resistor remaining, okay? And from here, I'm going to have, from the emitter of the Q4, I have the resistor right here, and from the same emitter of the Q4, it's just one, wire remaining, okay, from the emitter of the Q4 over here, I'm going to have one to the base of the big transistor, okay. So, I mark it down. This one and the resistor is mounted and the link here, linking the emitter to the base. I'm almost done with it, okay. Last component I want to talk about, the speaker. In the diagram, they specify it's a uh, uh, eight ohm speaker, and I'm gonna mount. Take a look here. Eight ohm speaker is the smallest one I have. Quarter watt, with compared to this one, three watt is gonna be a big difference. Anyway, I'm gonna mount it. So, one leg here, one to the positive. I'm disconnecting the top project because I don't need it now. We just need the replica we just made and by doing this we have to give it power hey can you see it's working i don't need to check anything i just respect it step by step the wiring and it's working fine but take a look at the sound i want you to notice this one has a plastic membrane and is a very small speaker okay instead of this i could use Another one, but this has a metallic membrane. This is not appropriate. If you were ever mount something like that, uh, by the way, it's also eight ohms, okay? So I respect eight ohms, it's 0.4 watt. It should be stronger than the other one. But the problem is the metallic membrane is not appropriate for our project. You're going to see what's happening, okay? So don't make connections with power on, by the way. The power is off. Power on. See, the sound is not appropriate because that's a metallic membrane, okay? If I use the other one we used before, I connect now the, the big speaker over here and we give it power. It does exactly like before. Take a look. I connect it over the top. Can you see they are identical? This was the replica, and this was the original. You see? It's working very well. And now, I'm showing you a good compromise. I have here one I just bought yesterday. It's 8 ohms, but it's only 1 watt instead of 3. Uh, as you may expect, it requires some wires because it didn't come with wires already soldered. It's no big deal. Please notice, on this one here, you're going to find something strange. You find the polarity over the speaker. You don't have to worry about the polarity because this is only useful when you build a stereo amplifier and you want the speakers to go uh, when receiving sound both at the same time in the, both directions because if you don't respect in the stereo connections positive negative, 
you may have the uh, the speakers making opposite way to each other so the sound you won't hear appropriately as we don't have anything stereo we don't care about this we just need to solder two wires to the speaker to make a connection it won't take long we just have to solder the wires that's it okay this being done is the first time we are going to connect this kind of speaker over here but the trick is exactly like the bigger one it has a um, paper membrane is a special kind of paper is not the one you're writing on so the positive and the collector of the big transistors power on I think it makes a decent sound okay so regardless what kind of speaker you use excepting for the metallical membrane which is not good for our project paper membrane is good even plastic is decent okay this is how you make all the links and the project is working at the first attempt if you respect the wiring okay that being said we're gonna go back starting next tuesday to our logic stuff thank you very much for watching Bye-bye.